New appeals today to do more for Puerto Rico. The island is still reeling from its worst storm in a century, and there are calls to cut red tape and get more relief on the ground quickly. John Yang has the story. A full week after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, patience, like so many other things, is in short supply, especially over federal disaster aid. He, President Trump, has the power. If he could show his power in Puerto Rico, things would be different, very different. Many people don't trust him. For a second straight day, President Trump defended his administration's response, saying the government is doing everything it can. Massive amounts of water, food and supplies, by the way, are being delivered on an hourly basis. It's, uh, it's something that nobody's ever seen before from this country. Today, Puerto Rican Governor Ricardo Rosseo said the U.S. territory needs a sweeping aid package. The proud U.S. citizens that live in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, want to wanna work, want to deal with the emergency. Our ask is that we treat Puerto Rico equally, uh, that we attend to the devastation. And if we do that, we can avoid a humanitarian crisis in the United States. At a Senate hearing, Acting Homeland Security Secretary Elaine Duke said efforts are hampered by the condition of the Puerto Rican government. The capacity of the uh, Puerto Rican government is severely dis diminished, um, both because of Hurricane Irma, their prior existing uh, financial situation, and the devastation wracked by the direct hit of Maria. We're using the DOD to now help with distribution. That generally is something that the, the Commonwealth would do itself. Senators of both parties pushed Duke to waive long-standing shipping restrictions, known as the Jones Act, to help get supplies to the Island. That waiver was given to Houston, was given to Florida. It's a week to be able to get even a vessel to them. Uh, so the longer it takes to be able to get that waiver done, then p vessels can't even start uh, getting there. Much of the aid that has reached the island has not made it much farther than San Juan. They have not evaluated the real level of damage, and they are doing what they can, however they can. But since there isn't communication, people don't know what to do or how to do it. With help like a U.S. Navy hospital ship, the comfort still days away, states and municipalities have sent help on their own. Even individuals like NBA player J.J. Barre are pitching in. He borrowed the Dallas Mavericks team plane to fly aid into his native Puerto Rico earlier this week. For many on the island, it remains a do-it-yourself recovery with a patchwork of desperate fixes. We'll take a closer look now at the situation on the ground in Puerto Rico. For that, I spoke a short time ago with Camila Dominoski of NPR. She joined me via Skype from the capital, San Juan. Camila, I know you're in San Juan now, but I understand you've been out into the, some of the areas around, especially into the mountains. What have you found there? What are conditions like there? People have absolutely no power. Most people don't have any running water. The water situation in particular is quite dire. Where there is bottled water available in grocery stores, the lines are incredibly long. So when we were up in the mountains near Calle, near Ibonito, uh, near Guamo, we saw people gathering water from mountain streams to drink, to cook with, to clean with, waiting in line for non-potable water that had been sitting stagnant in municipal tanks for days, and going to rivers to take baths and wash laundry. Many of these people, their homes were completely destroyed or partially damaged in the storm. And a lot of people said they haven't seen any aid whatsoever reaching their communities. The mayor of Cuamo, I spoke with him this morning, and he said that the sum total of aid that his municipality received was five pallets of water, which is nothing compared to the need. You say people out in the, uh, the hinterlands, as it were, are seeing very little aid. How does that compare with San Juan? San Juan is somewhat better off. It's still difficult for people to find resources, even here. The lines for ATMs for cash are very long. The lines for gas are very long. I've talked to people who have driven all over the, the, the city looking for generators. Uh, I talked to a family whose generator was actually destroyed in the storm, and there's simply none to be found. But the food availability, the water availability here in the city is better off. People can buy things when they need them, which is not the case in some of these more isolated communities. So is it the case that the aid is getting into the city, but they can't get it out beyond it? Is that the situation? 
that's the frustration that I was hearing from people in these communities and even from the mayors who I spoke with this morning here in San Juan who were coming to petition to ask for more help to say that they need more resources in their communities. That said, the government of Puerto Rico will tell you the resources are getting out. It's just very difficult, very dangerous, and slow. So conflicting reports about how much of the aid is actually being distributed out of the ports here. But there are certainly people who say they haven't seen any, any FEMA trucks, that they haven't seen any drop-offs, or that the only help they've seen has been coming from their own local communities, neighbors helping each other and mayors serving their communities. Do you get any sense of why that is? Is it that roads are blocked, that there are no drivers, there are no trucks? What's the problem? I've certainly heard reports that the problem is that there are not enough drivers. I heard that from a man who runs a logistics company, he said that people aren't available for work. I've heard that there's not enough diesel and the lines for fuel are hours and hours long. Again, though, the Officials with the Puerto Rican government will tell you that distribution is happening, that there's not a gas shortage, and that resources are getting out there. Uh, but on the ground, you, it's certainly not visible. Camila Dominoski of NPR, thanks so much for your on-the-ground reporting. Yeah, thank you for having me. The Pentagon said today it's shifting its response to provide long-term support to FEMA in Puerto Rico. But critics say the military could have done a lot more a lot earlier. To examine that question, we're joined by Philip Carter. He's a former Army officer who was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration. He's now a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University. Mr. Carter, welcome. We just had an interview with a, uh, a reporter on the scene in Puerto Rico. She said that, that as the Trump administration has been talking about how much aid has been delivered to Puerto Rico, she says a lot of that isn't getting out of San Juan. It's having trouble getting out into other parts of the island because they can't have, they can't find truck drivers. Is that something the military could have helped with? Absolutely. So Puerto Rico is a fairly large island. It's about 100 miles wide and 40 miles deep. It's got mountains on it that are uh, up to almost 5,000 feet high. And the population's not just in San Juan, but it's all over the island. And, and so it's one thing to even get the supplies there. It's another to get it throughout the island to people who need it. And that's something that military units have a unique capability to do because they're used to pushing supplies in very arduous terrain, whether it's Puerto Rico, Korea, or Afghanistan. What, what else could the military or the Pentagon be doing in Puerto Rico? So Puerto Rico is unique. It's an island in the sense that you can't rely on adjacent states or counties for mutual aid when a disaster strikes. The military has got this unique, deployable logistics capability that can pick up and move by air or sea to anywhere in the world. And that's the kind of capability Puerto Rico needs now. It needs power, clean water, food, medical care. And the types of support the military provides its own troops in combat can be life-saving in a place like Puerto Rico after a disaster like Maria. You talked about medical care. The, the, the Pentagon announced this morning that the, uh, the, comfort, the, the hospital ship, the Comfort, had been requested to get underway, but it's not leaving until getting underway until Friday, and will take five days to get to Puerto Rico. That's right. And in the interim, there are ground units and others that can plug that gap and also do things so that Puerto Rico's existing infrastructure can continue to function. The, uh, the Pentagon said today that roughly 50 of 70 hospitals are still operating, but they need uh, fuel for their generators, medical supplies, clean water, and other supplies. And those are things the military can help with, too. Should the Pentagon have been asked to do more earlier in response to the hurricane? That's a hard judgment call. The FEMA and Defense Department were stretched already by Harvey and Irma, and for them to have leaned forward in the Maria response might have been too much. Uh, that said, they certainly underdid it, and now we're seeing the effects of that judgment call. And we've heard about the military being stretched between Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, overseas, but are they stretched in terms of the domestic response to things like this? Yes, and part of the problem is that a lot of the logistics units necessary for the Puerto Rico mission come from reserve components. And it's harder to call them up and deploy them than simply snap your fingers and send the Marines or the 82nd Airborne Division down to Puerto Rico. Those units take days or weeks to mobilize and deploy, and uh, pulling them off of whatever training or deployment cycles they're on can also be taxing to the Pentagon. Philip Carter of the Center for a New American Security, thank you very much. Thanks, John.